It's really lovely to be here. Um, you're all doing really well, soldiering through a very long and exciting day. Um, this is as the tone of everyone's presentation has been, this is going to be a little different. <laughs> but I think um, different in a way that is productive, hopefully. So, yeah. While products of nature were not regarded as patentable, and I'm, and I'm also using patent, but also protection uh, in the sense of certificate of a variety, um, until the early 20th century, the law has changed to recognize different aspects of living things that can be rendered intellectual property. From plants, seeds, animals, microbes, viruses, genes, um, which count sort of as material, to also processes like testing and altering um, of the genetics. Um, now, as the IP protection of plants has changed through the 20th century, the images that accompany the patent applications have changed too. From color photographs of new varieties um, to images of electrophoresis gels and sort of gene markers um, th that claim to explain the phenotypic differences being patented, images have taken on a more explicative role in patent applications. Um, so by comparing the visualizations used in early plant patents to those accompanying more recent utility uh, patent applications, and by tracking these changes in patent illustration with respect to their accompanying text, what is the relationship between the drawing and the text, uh, what kind of meaning and value does the drawing have, I'm hoping to demonstrate a shift from pure description to explication in the underlying innovation. So some of the questions that I'm asking are, how do patent drawings fit into the history of representation and scientific practice, which is something that historians of science have paid quite a lot of attention to, but have not really taken patent drawings into account in any serious way. But also, how has the role of the image in the patent changed with respect to the plant science, the patent law, as well as technologies of visualization. Because as you can imagine, the 20th century has also seen some pretty huge changes in what can be visualized and understood about uh, biological material and processes. So I'm going to start with the, uh, it's going to be a very US-centered story. Um, that's where most of my research is being done right now. And I'm going to start with the Plant Patent Act of 1930. So to protect the property rights of private investors, the Plant Patent Act guaranteed at that time 17 years of exclusive rights for new varieties of asexually propagated plants. Plants that reproduce by roots, shoots, or buds. Sexually propagated plants were excluded and after um, plant scientists of the American Society of Horticultural Sciences argued that the characteristics of the new varieties would not be genetically stable. The, the PPA relied heavily on visual representation to demarcate both the novelty of the invention and the ingenuity of the inventor. While utility patent applications, both then and now, need to show novelty and the inventive step, breeders in the early 20th century could not scientifically explain the process through which they had produced the novelty that they sought to protect. For the PPA, the ability to graft, propagate, and thereby retain the salient novel features of the plant stood in for the inventive step. Since, as asexual organisms, these plants required botanical and human intervention to persist. Consequently, human expertise, rather than inventiveness, becomes an inextricable portion of the patentable invention itself. Taking inventiveness out of the equation, these images provided proof of their uniqueness thereby ensuring their patentability based purely on novelty. Images were crucial to these early patents because inventors did not have to show the method of production of the novelty, but only describe the novel features, which the pictures did with a plumb. The drawings, um, and according to the guidelines um, of the first uh, Plant Patent Act, um, were presented as permanent watercolor renderings, which were meant to faithfully present the appearance of the plant. Such drawings were um, sort of contrasted with me mechanical inventions and were not meant to be mechanical drawings and should be instead artistic. 
and competent in their execution. Um, Figure numbers and reference characters need not be included uh, unless specifically uh, required by the examiner. The drawing must disclose all the distinctive characteristics of the plant which are capable of visual representation. Drawing requirements will be strictly adhered to because the claim incorporates the drawing by reference. This is from the original act. Now, Petra Moser and Paul Rode have shown that nearly half of the 3,010 plant patents granted between 1931 and 1970 were for roses, plants for which the visual representation was crucial to show novelty. Um, as scholars in the history of patent law, such as Dan Kevelis, have shown, breeders of rose and fruit trees, such as Paul Stark of Stark Brothers Nursery, were the driving force behind the act coming into uh, fruition. However, Moser and Rode have also shown that through the registration data, which is not um, related to the patent um, uh, sort of prior art claims uh, per se, um, that U.S. breeders actually created fewer varieties after 1930 compared to before. Uh, European breeders continued to create most of the roses after 1930, and only one American breeder was amongst the 10 of the largest number of registrations. Uh, the data also shows that only a small share of newly developed roses, less than one in five, were patented. So in fact, um, I think the first half of the 20th century, the horticultural societies were much more of a recognized space of making priority claims in the sort of IP broad sense, um, rather than the patents. Um, and because less than a fifth of the new varieties were patented. Um, because, uh, so that's what, they, that's what Moser and Rode use as sort of evidence for um, the non-relationship between innovation um, uh, and patent, and the, and the first patent act. Now, I want to look at a particular case of someone who I think, um, I, I'm glad that um, Professor Radic brought um, him up earlier, uh, a very curious character indeed, um, Luther Burbank. Um, the, the first Plant Patent Act came, into, um, came about after his death. He died in 1926, but he was one of the main protagonists in the, in the creation of the act. Um, in his earlier writings, uh, Burbank was against um, the patenting of biological materials. Writing in 1911, no patent can be obtained on any improvement of plants, and I, for one, am glad that it is so. But by 1921, as he got better skilled as a breeder and sort of realized possibly through his uh, funders, the Stark brothers, that there was a lot to be gained from protection, um, he changed his tune um, and said something that has been quoted a lot, but I think warrants repeating, a man can patent a mousetrap or copyright a nasty song, but if he gives the world a new fruit that will add millions to the value of Earth's nat annual harvests, he will be fortunate if he is rewarded by so much as having his name connected with the result. Um, Burbank, as well as several of the seed manufacturers and horticulturalists, lobby for protection of the varieties. Um, several of the early patents were rewarded to Burbank posthumously, um, and uh, Robert, Allen, Robert Starr Allen has written that the patent examiners were especially lenient in granting patents for nursery stock that Burbank had developed uh, with financing from Stark Brothers, who were the big proponents of the act. Um, uh, in 1933 alone, um, you know, many uh, seven years after his death, the USPTO granted nine patents to uh, the Burbank estate, um, two for roses four for plums, two for peaches, and one for a new variety of cherry. As late as 1937 and 1938, the USPTO granted three more uh, patents to Burbank, and those were for roses. None of these roses, however, were um, commercial successes. Um, but during his career, uh, Burbank's methods um, of staking productivity and priority claims anticipated the kinds of visual guidelines that would undergird the Plant Patent Act. In developing new varieties uh, from, with funding from commercial nurseries, um, Burbank relied first on the formal system of IP Broad, which was functioning at the time, registration, and 
then publication in horticultural society lists, but he went further. Burbank procured cutting edge technology from, for the creation of color photographs that was only just being developed in the early 20th century uh, by Eastman in upstate New York and built a print studio in the upper levels of his house in Santa Rosa and produced high quality images to accompany his novel uh, plants. He used these images in publicity materials as well as in the production of a 12 volume collection of his writings complete with instructions on how uh, two budding breeders, and this is the sort of productivity um, claims part of his contribution because uh, he, he dedicated these volumes to uh, preeminent statesmen and inventors and sent them copies um, who, he, who he considered uh, colleagues uh, like Edison. He considered himself, him, uh, Edison to be a friend and uh, colleague. Um, in all the publications, he would include a guide to the process of color photography. So this is color photography explained nine. It goes from one through nine. Um, and uh, in a way of sort of explaining why this process uh, would render a more true um, color representation of the plants. And I think this sort of truth claim about his invention um, was in an attempt to seem more objective and uh, have to have more sort of convincing force for his novelties, right? So he wanted, because the visual was where the difference could be seen and included this sort of, um, so this is the yellow rambler and here is a sort of color guide that would accompany the photograph so that people could say um, um, what they were compared to. How a color, a color photography was new and needed explication and reiteration is better than the accepted mode of representation in botanical material, painting both in water and oil. The use of this new technique of visualization caught on, but, but, but since the medium was not popularized until the latter half of the century, the patent law allowed both forms. As the law states, drawings may be in color, where color is a distinguishing character of the new plant, the drawing must be in color. The colors, the colors depicted must correspond with their respective color designations set forth in, in the specifications defined in a recognized color dictionary which is specifically identified in the specification. This is part of the language in the, in the guidelines. Um, photographs or permanently mounted color photographs were considered acceptable um, and other requirements about margins and the such like. But yeah, I think it's really interesting that um, they had, they, ex they were accepting uh, a form of visualization that really wasn't available to the public as a legitimate proof of um, the new plant that was being patented. Um, so just to sort of wrap up the Burbank section, what Burbank was doing was uh, a very sort of idiosyncratic method of crossing random varieties, oftentimes on one um, uh, root stock uh, with up to 300 different kinds of different varieties in order to find um, specific characteristics that he could then mine, but he was really not interested in the multiplication and propagation part. He would, he would uh, hand that over to the Stark brothers and they would be responsible for the, um, the release and the sale. Um, Burbank was really much more interested in the inventing part of it. Um, and so he, the, and the color photography sort of was his way of um, convincing people that what he was doing was legitimate. So moving from the uh, patents to uh, variety protection, um, you see a change in the kinds of visual rhetoric that is being used. So, um, so far the story um, of the plant patents has been almost entirely within the US because it isn't until the latter half of the 20th century that you start having legislation around the world that allows for the protection of varieties. Um, and the Plant Variety Protection Act is actually the US's way of catching up with the UP of um, legislation that has already been happening in um, outside. So in 1970, the plant varieties protection allowed for the patenting of sexually reproducible uh, species as a breeder's protection of variety. Um, but even then, it wasn't as if the, um, the inventive step per se could be clearly articulated. What was more uh, 
shown in the applications were the steps taken to arrive at, and actually quite similar to some of the presentations that we've seen today, the steps that were taken by the breeders to arrive at their novel um, variety. Um, so let's look at an example. Um, this one is actually a very uh, a recent one, but it's uh, filed, uh, got a certificate from under the, the Varieties Act. It's from, it was granted in eight, on 18th of January 2013. And it is for a, a kind of watermelon, um, SP5. And it was granted to Syngenta Crop Protection. And they claim that this is a new variety for three reasons. It has a resistance to a zucchini virus, it has tan seeds and not red seeds, and the seeds are, uh, has bigger seeds and not smaller seeds compared to previous varieties, right? Three pretty I mean, reasonable claims. And the images that, that go um, along with the application are these two. Um, one is an example of the fruit, what it looks like, and the other one is a comparison between um, SP6, oh sorry, so the seeds are smaller. Um, sorry, the seeds are bigger in SP6. This is the one on the left this is the one that they're trying to patent versus SP5, which is the previous version. Bigger seeds tan rather than red. Um, what's interesting is that neither of these images shows the main feature of the new breed, which is the resistance to the zucchini virus. So the image that shows this is actually a table. Um, this table shows the resistance in the new um, uh, variety, but it is, it, I mean, it is a visual rhetoric that's being used, but it isn't a, a graphic one, right? So you don't need to see the picture of the watermelon to know that it is resistant. It is, in fact, something that you have to show with data in this, in this form. So we can already start to see a shift in the visual technologies and the rhetorics um, in, uh, to a form of sort of comparison rather than the image speaking for itself about everything that is um, patentable about uh, a new creation. But things are going to change further, of course, as you can imagine. Um, as of 1980, the Chakravarti patent on um, Sudamonas putida is the first case of an instance of a legitimate patenting of biological material under the utility um, side. And the inventive claim, uh, sorry, the inventive step was being able to figure out what this does and being able to figure out the synthetic. As of 2014, there are three different kinds of protection that um, the U.S. Patent Office provides, but while design and, pat and plant are obvious, the utility ones are a bit more complicated. Um, but what's interesting to note is that the plant patents account for a very small percentage of the current um, U.S. PTO granted um, patents. Of the 1,149 um, uh, plant patent applications, only 860 were granted, and that's compared to the total patent applications of 5,000, sorry, 56, sorry, 576,763 applications that were made in 2012, of which only 1,149 were for plants, and of them only, uh, well, a little under 1,000 were granted. So the plants are actually quite small compared to the utility and design. Um, and the form that the plant takes in the utility patent uh, has actually changed quite a lot. And it's actually worth looking at an example. So a patent was granted to, um, for tomato plants exhibiting continuous light tolerance to three researchers, um, Milena, Johannes, and Van Poppel. Um, they, were, they were looking to get a patent on both the method the, of the product, the plant, as well as the gene for continuous light tolerance. Ah, great. Um, and the, the, the first image that they have in their application is to show that um, uh, most plants cannot withstand continuous light um, on them. They need time to rest. Uh, but this is, they have found a way of figuring out uh, whether or not a plant can continuously tolerate light. And that, of course, will mean that it'll be a faster uh, producer, and because that's the um, you know plants need the light to make their their fun stuff. Um, the other the other images that were in the in the application were was sort of genotypic information on um, the different populations, 
but also uh, sequences of genetic markers that they found to be in the continuous light tolerant varieties. So, uh, but, oh, sorry, before I move to the next thing. So there's a stark contrast in the kinds of drawings that are used to show um, what is being patented here. On one hand, the predominance of genetic information that isn't visual, but still encodes description of the novelty is, has been achieved by the inventor. The graphic is only a small part of an assemblage of representative tools used by the inventors to stake their claim. In some cases, applicants still submit images that hearken to an age where color, shape, and arrangement play a role. For instance, in this 2012 patent for a cherry tree named Royal Chioga, um, which, claim, which claims to combine the features of early blooming, um, attractive red skin color, and good fruit quality. Um, the image that is on the front page is sort of, this is from 2012, is, is, it's, it's a rep, it looks a lot more like the watercolor images from the early 20th century, lit head on with the absence of shadows. Um, this image harkens back to older visual styles of herbarium specimens where fruit and leaves are displayed in abstraction. And on some level, the cut openness resembles uh, even older tradition of 17th century Dutch, Dutch uh, still life. The, the cutting open of this cherry while satisfying the curiosity of the scientist and the patent application to show the, the traits that, they're, that they're, they're claiming to be new also aligns with the Dutch practice of opening in order to reveal to our sites the makings of the objects in their still life. Once printed within a patent application, the photograph takes on value and meaning within law and science, which is not to be confused with objectivity. Optical consistency, which alleviates the burdens of objectivity, is where the, these set of drawings in patent applications fit. So to have optical consistency, you only need to make sense within all the others within the same genre, rather than having any reference to nature per se. Right? So the reality that's being constructed is with, entirely within the patent law. It's a little abstract. But I hope you will forgive me for that humanities person. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. I was going to say a little bit more, but everyone's tired. And I have to say thank you. Thanks to the organizers and to my university. Um, yeah, happy to take any questions.